Hey, a friend, Chris here from WhiteLogicProRules.com, the website that helps you get the most you can out of Apple's Logic Pro. Welcome to video number nine, which is the second to last video in our Atmos series. So far through this series, we've been really focused on the mechanics of Atmos in Logic Pro. First, we talked about gear. Then we talked about flipping your stereo project into an Atmos project, how surround panners differ from 3D object panners, and so many other details. In today's video, First, I want to play for you a mix that I did both in stereo and in Atmos. A direct comparison side by side. Stereo versus Atmos. Atmos versus stereo. Just in the hopes that maybe you'll glean something by listening to these two different versions side by side. After that, I want to share with you some insights that I picked up along the way working on my first ever Atmos mix, as well as some key decisions I made early on that just helped me streamline my workflow. Of course, before we dig in, let's shout out our sponsor of the series, which is IK Multimedia. Now, IK has truly been heroic in their support of this series on Wide Logic per rules. And I don't think I would have done this series without their help, honestly. IK supported this series by sending along on loan a set of their iLoud MTM Immersive Bundle of speakers. And this bundle is awesome. The iLoud MTM Immersive Bundle is a bundle of 11 of the very popular iLoud MTM speakers from IK, which you can see right behind me. And these speakers are awesome. They sound fantastic. They're easy to mount just about anywhere thanks to the fact that they're light and small and have a built-in threading right underneath them so you can mount them on something as simple as a microphone stand, as I've done in my own space. And thanks to the built-in ARC technology, you can tune each speaker to your space so what you're hearing from each speaker is something you know you can trust. I'll include a link in the description below as well as in this video that will take you right to IK's website if you want to learn more all about the iLoud MTM Immersive Bundle. All right, so the project in front of us we've heard a few times through this series. This is the song Hooks by the artist Soviet Dolls. And the band sent along the multi-tracks for me to mix in stereo. And just seemed like a great song and opportunity to dig into Atmos for the series. As you may remember from video number four, I saved a separate project alternative of this project by going to File, going to Project Alternatives. And I saved a separate alternative for the stereo version of this mix. And then I saved an alternative to work on the Atmos version of this mix. And after I separated these stages as their own distinct alternatives within the project file, I made sure to bounce out the stereo version of this project and import it into my Atmos session, which is right at the bottom here. So I imported the stereo bounce to use as a reference as I worked on my Atmos project. I muted the stereo reference. So now any time that I click on the solo button, I'm able to quickly solo the stereo mix and then click on the solo button again to return this track to a muted state. So now if I select a different track lane, we can see the master channel strip on the right side of the inspector. And now I'm gonna click on the Atmos plugin and we're gonna set the monitoring format first to 2.0. It's worth pointing out right now that headphones are required for listening to all audio examples in this video. First, we'll listen to the stereo mix. This audio example you can listen to on anything whether it be on headphones or studio monitors or the built-in speakers on your Mac. But for all the Atmos audio examples, we'll be listening through the Dolby renderer as well as the Apple spatial audio renderer. And those will not render effectively on anything other than headphones. So I just recommend that you listen to this entire video using only headphones. All right, cool. So first, let's take a listen to the stereo mix. And I'll play about 30 seconds of this song for you to check out. Here we go. All right, so there's the stereo mix as you've always experienced stereo to sound. Next, let's take a listen to the Atmos version of this mix through the Dolby binaural renderer. I'll leave the Dolby Atmos plugin up as we listen so you can see any 3D object action that might be taking place. Here we go.
right. So that's the Atmos version through the Dolby renderer. Let's now switch to the Apple Special Audio renderer. So the way that you would hear this Atmos production on Apple Music once it's uploaded for distribution. Here we go. Right, there you go. The two different versions of this production, one in stereo, the other in a multi-channel Atmos environment. So I'll leave it up to you to decide which you prefer. From here, I want to share with you some insights that I feel I took away from this experience of working in Atmos for the first time, in no small part thanks to the fact that I have speakers and headphones at my disposal as I worked, but also some key decisions I made early on just to make my life easier as I dug in. I think it's really smart to start and finish the stereo version of your production first before you dig into the Atmos version, mainly because I think a lot of the decisions you're going to be making in terms of tonal balance with EQ, dynamic balance with compression and limiting, creative decisions with different plugins. Once you make these decisions and get them smoothed out in the stereo version, where you just have like a window this big to work with, most of that will translate to the Atmos world once you start panning tracks around the room. Now, not to suggest that stereo and Atmos are identical or what works in stereo will work just as well in Atmos. But I'll say for this production, I didn't really reassess any of my creative decisions or tonal balance decisions at all. I maybe nipped a little bit of the low meds in the vocals, maybe something in the top end of a synth. But other than that, I spent 80 to 90% of my time just focused on panning. Which panners to use? Where should I put stuff? Should I write automation to move sounds around the listener? That was the bulk of my decision-making on speakers and with headphones. Also, I feel it was incredibly beneficial for me to bounce the stereo mix out of Logic Pro to import into my Atmos session, which provided me a direct reference with the stereo mix as I worked on my Atmos project. And though I believe that the Atmos mix should be more adventurous and start to explore territories that the stereo mix just simply can't accomplish, I do believe it's important to reference the stereo mix because let's say you flip to the stereo mix from your Atmos mix, and you think to yourself, huh, the stereo mix sounds way better than the Atmos mix. That was a key indicator to me that maybe I went a little too far with some of my Atmos decisions. So that brings us to point number two. I just said I spent most of my time in this Atmos project just focused on where to put stuff around the listener in the room. And you might be wondering, well, hey, where should you put your different tracks and sounds around the listener in room in your projects? What's a better panner for different types of tracks? Surround panner or 3D object? I hate to say it, there's really no right or wrong in this department. There are folks out there that like to exclusively rely on 3D object panning for all their tracks. And there are other folks who like to rely on the surround bed. So what I can share with you are the decisions I made for this project as I worked on it. And also what I found I liked and didn't like and what I felt worked and didn't work is I listened to Atmos tracks on Apple Music. If we take a look in the mixer, you're going to notice that a lot of my different panners across my project are mostly surround panners with just the occasional 3D object panner. And this was a very intentional decision. I decided early on that I would stick with surround panners for placing sounds around the listener until I felt creatively stifled for placing sounds outside of particular speaker positions or if I wanted to place a sound closer to the listener or above them. So for example, if we hone in on this synth right here that occur between the verses and the pre-chorus, if we take a look at the track stack track, take a look and a listen to the synth using the 3D object panner. So to me, that sound feels very much like a shooting star shooting overhead. It occurs again right here. If we take a look at the third one, slightly different. So I want to emphasize this interpretation I had of this sound as a shooting star. But now if we take a listen in the mix, 
It just felt like a pretty cool way to make a moment of the synth sound each time it happens. But this type of panning would just not be possible with the surround panners. Similarly, I have a reverse crash that zips around. There are also some percussion elements that are not using 3D object panning, but are panning around the listener. And we also have some sound effects down towards the bottom. So let's introduce those. And most of these are using 3D object panning. As far as I understand, and I have found as well, 3D objects are really best fit for any sounds that you want to place specifically with pinpointed accuracy in the listening environment, not just at particular speaker positions. Also, 3D objects are great for moving sounds above the listener because you have the ability to place sounds not just up, but also anywhere front to back, left to right above the listener. But another key decision I made was for all of the foundational instruments in my mix, from the bass, to the kick, the clap or snare, as well as the vocals, everything I consider a foundational instrument in the mix, I made sure to pan to the front of the room. So if we solo the vocals and most of the drums and the bass, take a listen. To me, these instruments are a foundational aspect of any mix, and it felt most appropriate to put them at the front of the room. That's where I feel I would expect the vocalist and the kick and the bass to be anyways, which then gave me the ability to play around with panning of other instruments, such as synths and guitars. So if we take a listen and a look. Many of these instruments are still at the front of the room, but I also took advantage of reverbs and delays to place ambience around the listener. Let's take a look and a listen. So you can see with this clap reverb that I've got it focused on the back of the room. But I also have a front room reverb as well. So an instrument may be in the front of the room, but there's trails of the instrument towards the back or to the sides, thanks to the ability to place reverbs and delays around the room as well. Point number three, I decided early on to not bother with the LFE output of the surround bed at all. First, I don't have a subwoofer, so I felt handicapped by this fact that I wasn't sure what could be happening down at the bottom on a speaker based setup. And second, I ended up connecting output number four of my audio interface that would go to the LFE and I connected it to my center speaker. And I can tell you that the audio being sent to the LFE is the full range, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So it might be worth it to load an instance of a channel EQ or linear EQ in multi-mono mode before the Dolby Atmos plugin. And for the LFE tab, set a high pass filter to 20 hertz and a low pass filter to 120 hertz. This way, any audio being sent to the LFE of the surround bed, you can be sure will just be the low end content of those tracks. And in fact, Dolby itself recommends that we do this anyways. Point number four, I also decided early on in the mix to not bother changing any of the binaural render distance options. Now, if you're not familiar, the binaural distance options allow you to adapt the feeling of distance of your 3D objects and surround bed outputs, specifically for headphone playback. 
For example, if we take a listen to this tambourine, I'll set the distance option to near, and we'll flip between near and far. Now it's definitely cool that you can customize this for headphone playback to create that sense of a tambourine being further away or closer or somewhere in between. But here's the thing, Apple, the company that's trying to push Atmos and spatial audio forward, the Dolby codec that Apple is using for Apple Music to play back spatial audio tracks, it doesn't take into consideration any of these distance options that you set for binaural playback. It just seemed like a lot of extra grief for not a lot of upside. That might be a very ignorant perspective, I get that but that's what I decided for this project and probably for the foreseeable future. The last thing I wanna bring up for today is the question of are headphones good enough for Atmos production? Can you get by with a pair of studio headphones or a pair of AirPods and not have to invest in a speaker-based setup and an expensive audio interface and all those other details that come with a speaker-based system? And I would say absolutely, but with one caveat, and that is that you try to experience your Atmos production in as many different ways as you can with as many different perspectives as you can based on what you have available to you. What I mean by this is, is that you're taking advantage of both binaural renderers in the Atmos plugin. So you're listening to your Atmos production as you're working on it and mixing it through both the Dolby renderer as well as the Apple spatial audio renderer because these each give you a different perspective of your project. Additionally, if you own an Apple device that has a true depth camera and you're working on a Mac that's compatible, you can use that device to create a personalized spatial audio profile that will help you better hear what's going on in your Atmos mixes because the Apple spatial audio renderer will be tuned to your particular physiology. The personalized spatial audio profile scans all sides of your head to understand how you yourself actually hear the world around you. If you own compatible AirPods, you can also take advantage of the head tracking feature which will make it a lot easier for you to discern where sounds are occurring around you because you can just turn your head and then know, oh, that's what that sounds like behind me or above me or to the side of me. Head tracking really is a great feature for understanding where things are around you. And even better, if you own a MacBook or a desktop Mac that has built-in speakers that supports Atmos and spatial audio, in that case, you can play your Atmos project on the speakers of your Mac hardware and know what it sounds like to hear your Atmos project in a room, in the open air. So by taking advantage of all the available options that the Dolby Atmos plugin provides you with, I think will be really helpful. It'll provide different contexts of different renderers on speakers if you have them through the personalized spatial audio and head tracking. So you'll have a much better idea what the heck is going on. Now I will say for myself, I never have had success mixing stereo on headphones. I don't think I'd be very successful mixing Atmos on headphones. But I would also say I would not want to mix Atmos without headphones. I think having speakers and headphones both provides a different perspective that's really helpful for coming to a good conclusion, a great Atmos mix. All right, I hope this video was helpful for you. I'll talk to you in video number 10, the final video in our Atmos series here on Wide Logic Pro Rules. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you later.